Hi Liam, thank you for talking about biomass. Anyone that thinks they can chop and replant an ecosystem and it be exactly the same as it was when you left is really misunderstanding the idea of how an ecosystem works. Yeah, that's, that's not going to work. Now Liam, I want to talk to you about that children's nursery story, the owl and the pussycat. More specifically, I want to talk to you about the beautiful pea green boat that they're in and the liquid that they're sitting on and also the, the, the moon that they they danced under. Yes Liam, I want to talk to you about tidal power. Now if you're unsure about how tidal power works specifically, um, I've put a link in the description from Student Energy and they do an amazing video explaining how tidal power works. It's very simple, it's very short, go and have a look. So tidal power is very regular, you can almost predict it. Unlike wind and solar which fluctuate during the day, like when I'm trying to film a video and the sun keeps going in and out of the clouds, the trick with tidal is that it doesn't always match demand. Tidal power could not be there when everybody gets home from work and wants to have a cup of tea but it's unique in the case that it's a renewable source that we can almost predict. It's been in development for a very long time. Now sort of leaving the research stage of things, it's going into demonstration projects. One demonstration project that's currently kicking off is actually in Scotland, a place called Pentland Firth, and, and there are strong currents that flow through that area. It's called a major end project, so essentially they have tidal turbines. It's almost like an underwater wind turbine. So as the current flows through, spins the turbine, generates electricity. This is underwater and you can't see it. So it's perfect for aesthetics, people that don't like wind farms. <laughs> Their phase 1A of the project will bring them up to 86 megawatts, sort of, and then they reckon they can get 400 megawatts out of this one site. Yeah, that's quite a lot of energy. So if you want to learn more about the Majin project, I'll put a link in the description. The UK has a massive tidal resource, and they think that this is a good source of energy for the future. The only trouble is, at the moment, it's very costly because it's in the development stages. Uh, and it's only just ramping up into commercial. Wind power and solar have the same issues, very expensive to start with, but as manufacturing became more efficient and precise and people actually knew what they were doing, rather than just putting windmills in the sea, the costs come down and people know how to work a project. So for actually tidal power to work, you need a large difference between high and low tide. So that makes things difficult. There's only a certain number of sites that you can commercially produce tidal power. So unlike wind and solar which you can put in quite a large area, solar you can put pretty much anywhere. But that's with current technology, so hopefully things will change as the technology changes. Maybe you can do it in weaker tidal areas, as now solar is moving further up into less iridescent areas. So another project is that's currently in planning stage, I think it's just been approved, is a Swansea Bay project. It's just in the south of Wales, and essentially what they want to build is a giant sea wall, like a harbour wall really. As the high tide goes up, the wall prevents it like a dam and then you get a height difference. And then you release the turbine to let the water flow through and the heights equalize. And you generate energy by doing that. It's projected to produce about 320 megawatts, which is quite a lot, and it's gonna be the largest tidal barrage of its kind in the world if it gets built. The estimated cost at the moment is one billion pounds, which is a huge amount of money, but the developer's argument is that it's gonna last for over a century producing power for all that time. So if you weigh out the costs, Yes, it's expensive, but maybe, maybe we're okay. At the moment, they're trying to negotiate with the government how much the government will pay them subsidies for the energy that they sell to the national grid, and I don't think that's going to go so well. The thing that I'm concerned about is that the effect on marine life, as we know, large artificial structures can change the way marine life works, so I'd be really interested to see if there are any studies on how tidal power is going to affect this. Fishermen are also concerned about the fish getting in the turbines and chopped up like sushi. I mean it's a quick way to get sushi. In South Korea they have one of the largest tidal power stations. They have a 12 kilometer sea wall and they have 10 turbines that produce 254 megawatts. Enough to power about half a million homes each year. These turbines are huge. They are 10 meters in diameter which is just good. I mean, it's like hydropower. You know I don't know if you ever stood in. No, you probably haven't. So basically Liam tidal power is only going to grow from here. It's only going up that way, it's ending the research sort of area thing, and it's moving on into the commercial deployment and development. I'm really interested to see how it's going to develop over these next few years, how it's going to be implemented, is it going to be implemented quick enough, are we going to see some good benefits from it, what are the effects on marine life, that's what I want to see more of. Can we use this effectively in a, in a renewable resource, and can it replace some of the other power stations? So there's a lot more discussion to be had on this, but this is a brief overview of tidal power. Liam, I'll I'll see you on Wednesday.